All right, guys. That's interesting. We're going to get started. It's always a full agenda, and we yes, never have enough yes. time to do all that we want to do in these meetings. I'm Maria Wolf, we your facilitator this evening. Um, thanks. It's great to see some additional faces, but it's also wonderful to see our familiar faces for this meeting each month. Um, did anybody have problems with the invite or feel like it didn't go to somebody that it needed to go to this time that we need to take note of? Okay, we're doing better on that point. Um, uh, we do have the agenda in front of you, and at the last meeting, um, the request was to go straight into reviewing our neighborhood agreement and um, address the ops plan as well. But um, before we do that, as always, we will have introductions. So um, let's go ahead and start around the table. Uh, if we could, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, I'm Jude. I'm an intern at the Health Housing Services Department. I'm just sitting in to see what's going on. Welcome. Oh. Hi, my name is Doug Small. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Mayor Pellet. Director of what? Public Affairs. Public Affairs. Yeah. And to the back. Uh, Jessica, I'm the Brown South Sam Paper Leader. Welcome. Good evening, Pete Bellero, District 6. Hi, Wilson, District 6. Mike Krachowski, Mike uh, resident uh, in this area for 36 years. And our tech expert for the mm -hmm. evening, arranging yes. for this meeting to be recorded and available for you. So you can so, like, hear all of the details again. Speak, enunciate, speak up. Practice e all of e those e consonants. That's a big word, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. So I check. Speak louder. Speak up and clearly. John. John Comstock, Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association in Parkland Village. I'm Melinda Frame. I'm with Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association. I chair our Homelessness Solutions Committee. I'm Rachel Baca. I'm from Seattle Hills Neighborhood Association. And um, it's like more than I'm the chair of homeless issues. Super. Uh, Janet Simon, uh, Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association. Hilton. Tanya Mullen, and I'm the interim president at South San Pedro Neighborhood. Our elections are in June, so please come to the meeting. Sorry, I got distracted. I'm also uh, working on the uh, task force to develop a community land trust in the International District more broadly and on the food sovereignty group for uh, the International District. Let's go to the back and then I'll talk to you all. Um, hi everyone, I'm Brenda, I'm a resident, but I've just been curious about the gateway and I'm here to learn. Mm -hmm. Super welcome. I'm uh, John Moore, also a resident, just here to watch. Welcome, thank Wally Burke from Parkland Hills. Wally, observing. <laughs> More than observing, I promise. And Donna Strong, resident, been here 36 years too. Very um, hi, Rachel Mendez, um, Public Outreach and Monitor Coordinator for HG. And I'm Laura Keene, I'm the Senior Crime Prevention Specialist with APD. Thank you, Laura. Laura, Laura's a rock star at APD. She gives us all the numbers and all of the hints. And so last meeting, we had a number of questions about when do you call 311 911 242 COPS? Does anybody want this handout? We're going to circulate these. Take them, sure. share them with your neighbors or anybody else who has this kind of question. Also, last time we had a number of questions come up from people who had not attended meetings about what does Gate will have online and what's coming online soon in this building. And um, it also has some reminders of who you call. So if you have forgotten the five uh, things that are coming on board for Gate Relief, it's summarized here. And uh, so you can take one of those handouts, and that should shorten a lot of our Q&A that often happens at the beginning of the meeting in terms of community concern. Um, the next thing I want to review is we always have our community guidelines that we work with in terms of our community to with each other for this meeting. So the first one, they're, they're always posted up here. 
is to be hard on issues but easy on people. Because no matter how we might see things differently, one thing we all agree on is that we are here because we're concerned about our community and we want to try to make change better. So let's be hard on the issues, but recognize that everybody in this room is spending their Thursday night together eating snacks and cake so that we can um, try to tackle issues and get some problems solved and figure out ways to move forward together. Um, we respect the speaker, but we also respect the listener. So if you have the opportunity to ask a number of questions are made a number of points, we ask that you look around, see if somebody else was ready to speak up as well. Give them a chance to speak before you meet them and uh, continue your dialogue. We like you to listen to learn and seek to understand. So instead of listening and thinking about what you're planning to say, let's like really listen and try to hear what that person is trying to communicate. So we don't parse grammar, we don't um, criticize that they use the wrong word, we just try to understand what they're trying to say. We understand time constraints. We have an hour and a half together. It always goes very fast because we're trying to cover a lot. And we try to be kind and solution focused because we're really trying to figure out how to work together and figure things out. Um, we have one more person who's joined us. We just did introduction. Would you like to introduce yourself, Terry? Yeah, hi folks. I'm Terry Schlinger, um, the director of the new program that's coming soon to the gateway. Um, and that's the receiving area. Super, great. Um, the next thing is we normally have areas here doing a presentation on um, current um, numbers from the Gateway Housing Navigation Center. And since we're jumping straight into the neighborhood information, um, the Good Neighbor Agreement and the OS plan, we'll just circulate this. And then if anybody has questions at the end, let us know and we can arrange for areas to respond to the questions. Okay. So there we go, half and half. She made sure there were plenty of copies for everybody. Okay, so um, with that, uh, we're um, going to go ahead and leap into the good neighbor agreement with you. So this was scheduled to be at a previous meeting and we ended up doing community concerns for the whole meeting. So we're going to jump into the good neighbor agreement with you. So how many of you have reviewed it recently and how things that you wanted to bring up that you are concerned about or questions that you have about it? Um, our intent tonight is to first make sure that we really hear what your questions or concerns are about it. Um, we'll see what we can answer tonight and what we need to explore more deeply in future meetings. So, who wants to go first? Hi, you. Okay, Pete. Um, there's considerable community concern about the non-compliance by the city in reference to the enforcement of the security zone uh, that we had agreed upon. As everybody in the room, well, not everybody, but most people will know, it used to be a quarter of a mile. We negotiated in good faith and it had extended to half a mile. The problem is it's not being enforced. That's the issue. Uh, I've, I've spoken with Gilbert, and he wrote a very nice letter, and it appears that some of the enforcement obstacles include maybe not, not enough personnel. So I have a solution. Get more personnel. Uh, this can't be a two or three day a week enforcement. It's got to be seven days a week. Um, a campus can be seen in front of this facility, around this facility, uh, on Easter. And if you notice, and most the folks who live here know, the public solution is fencing. That's what they're doing. 
offensive and everything on. And, and I think we can do better than that. This item will be placed on the D6 agenda on the 21st. Uh, one possible outcome could be for us to terminate for non compliance. Mm -hmm. I hope we don't go there, but that's an option. So I've got a heads up to everybody. And uh, I would ask, Doug, yeah, please, to convey to the mayor that we really need this address. So you brought up encampments. Um, what were the other issues that you feel are non compliance? Oh, what there's folks everywhere. There's folks everywhere? Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Uh, it's so bad that uh, Wilson and Whittier schools have declared a public safety uh, concern for walkers because walkers encamp these large groups of folks on the sidewalk. And, and I, you know, I, I, I want to recognize that certain, uh, probably ACS and or APD personnel move them, but they, they move from block A to block B. Uh, and then again, where do you move them to? That's the greater question. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real concern. I have, uh, I feel for their condition, and your situation, but the other on the other side, uh, I, I'm representing uh, blue collar communities that just don't feel we're being listened to in terms of this uh, this particular uh, map. On um, following up on what he said, um, I believe a lot of this falls underneath item B under coordinated response section B, which are these meetings and how we adjust this and uh the C action so maybe in addressing what dr Keaton has shared we look at how those sections are written so that we can maybe create some language that creates more ability for action and accountability do you have an idea suggestion of what you would like to no i mean okay that's just an immediate like sections we can be looking at specifically the address what he's talking about along with number two which is the encampments okay other concerns or specifics that you want to cite or rewrite i have a question yeah so um it says here under encampments that two people will be stationed here that are responsible for the encampments, right? So are those people not going out every day or what are they doing? When I think that's a good question, I think also that's a concern with just the number of people that are available. This was brought up with Carol Pierce um, at a community input meeting. Dr. Bachman are still drafting the operations plan. And I mean, she said that she realized the numbers of personnel were not really adequate and there was something we needed to work towards. But now that it's been in operation, we can see that they're not adequate. I feel like there is kind of evidence there that more people are needed and that we need to increase those numbers. Um, the other thing that was written in, I guess this is in the operations plan, but that we are supposed to have a phone number that residents could call really specifically towards these issues. We've never had a phone number. It's, we're always directed to 311. So this was the phone number specific for this area? Yeah, for the public safety zone surrounding Cuba. John or Janet or Wally, any others um, specific comments or concerns aside from what we posted here? Well, I'll just comment because perhaps is um, a, a part of what has perhaps not 
rolled out as one would have hoped is when, for instance, under C with the dispute resolutions is, it sounds good on paper, oh yes, that, you know, we'll, we'll all work it out here, but, you know, a lot of what's being brought up are uh, external issues that may not just be able to be worked out, you know, in this room. Well, can I say something? Doesn't it say that if that happens, you know, the party needs to address in writing to the other party what the issue is, and that party has 48 hours to cure the alleged breach? Is that, I mean, that's not happening, is it? I guess that's my overall yeah. comment. I, I don't believe that. A 48 hour response that this has necessarily when there has been um disputes or concerns brought up that they may not have been dealt with in the process that has been delineated here we have some new faces in the room do any of you guys who have up there before we yeah. had a chance to take a look at it your thoughts are getting through it without me i've not thought about it just want to make sure okay. i'm remembering several months back um a, a young man who introduced himself I think he was in charge of bringing business to the this area. A lot of, yeah, a lot of that come. And not so well. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought he was going to take over a building across the street from the uh, young people. Uh, Place there on San Mateo where they're supposed to go to dry out and get rid of um, a drinking DUI area. It's a blue building, blue building, right across the street from that. And I think that building since been torn down, and we haven't had an update on that from that gentleman on what he's doing to bring businesses into this part of town. So I. Uh, that was before I even started working. It was. Uh, so I think that that was like in May of last year or June. Well, I'm, so I suppose the question would be, since we haven't had an update, then is okay. what is being done to bring business in? It's something we feel strongly about. And so the rest of us. So economic revitalization efforts in this area. And, and an effort to bring in an anchor business. Um, I learned something since our last meeting that I had no idea, but when banks look for a place to put a branch in, they like to have an additional draw to the neighborhood besides just the bank. Because that means people coming and going from a grocery store, if there's if if the grocery store is within a couple blocks of the bank, there's a chance that the people will stop at the bank. So we need efforts to I guess bring in what I would call an anchor business in this, in this district, in this area. It's called anchor. It is the anchor. That looks so wrong. Um, yeah, they got you. Okay. Well, does anybody remember who that person was? I wanted to venture a guess if it was Alex Horton. Alex Horton. He's the one that's primarily. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if it was the blue building, uh, the building at Bell and San Mateo, they have taken over, they repainted it, they're operating their IDCDC group out of one of the units of that building. Um, I don't know, because I've been to meetings and stuff there, but I don't know about the blue one, I'm not sure. This is that one that's further north. So no, the blue one's directly across the street, and it's a, it's a detox place for, for cleaning. Are you talking about the door of the oh. company? That's no. a oh, you're thinking, are you thinking about by, it? Right by the bus stop. Um, 
It's fenced in. It's an afterblock south of Zoom. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So then that sounds like an update that yeah, does sound on that part. Okay. For sure. And and you know, I remember um Jasmine saying that we needed an update, um, needed to find a time for that to happen. So but, uh, I think we do. I, I know Pete wants to bring business in. Um I mean we all do. <laughs> but we need it feels like if you bring in a small business and they don't have people coming and going from the base, for example, don't have a reason to stop there. Another reason. So, we, in other words, it was a big loss to lose Walmart mm -hmm. because that brought a lot of people. To, uh, is that um, boxing place still? It's dead. It's dead. Yeah. So we're losing more than yeah. we're getting okay. still. Yeah, um, that's actually going to have uh, one of the um, boy, it's a reading program. Alex Horton on that building also. Yeah, so he's, he's he's but that's student. yeah, that's slated to be the at least portion of that. Yeah. Um, one of the literacy programs, the adult literacy program, yeah. is moving into that a portion of it. Okay. okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't know what street the Boston building is on. It's on San Mateo, but I think it's yeah, Boston. and Anderson. San Mateo, Anderson. Anderson, Anderson, right. Anderson yeah. Anderson. So the economic revitalization part of this is, is another concern. Okay. So is there anything missing from this list in terms of the good neighbor agreement that you have concerns about? Them? Want to see yeah. I'm not missing, but I was just going to say, as far as the economic, I feel like that fits in with item B1, B1. Just if we want to reference, like if we were looking at language as a GNA, yeah. it's talking about developing action plans by mapping assets and issues that the neighborhoods want to address. Oh, yeah. Asset and yeah. And that's under, yeah. One other attending points. Great. Okay. Does anybody? Oh, another. Um, and then also underneath action, it does talk about other. And I know this has come up at prior meetings, but other departments within the city. Uh, it's great we have Laura here because we had APD, ACS, Parks and Rec. You know, fire and rescue, solid waste can be more active members within these meetings as well, those representations. So um, that's maybe something we want to look at in the library for it's like, is it like quarterly where they come in, or it's here, you know, whatever. So clarify, well, which section is that? That would be, um, so coordinated response, which is section B, and then one, C under action. Okay. And that's, you know, Roman numeral two under that. So, and so the clarification is like, how often is the expectation? Right. We, we really can't expect them to come to every single okay. meeting, all of the different departments. But I can tell you that. When I have invited any of them to come at your request, they're there. They're, yeah. they're actually happy. Yeah. So, um, so is it upon invitation, or do you have an expectation of like a quarterly attendance? So, so maybe let's just ask you that now. I mean, is it that you want to see at least an annual update of their activities in this area? I don't 
yeah. 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 Y
We'll clean and remove trash daily from areas surrounding Gateway Center. Priority locations being sidewalks, bus stops, storefronts, and area park. Area parks, this isn't happening at all. So, um, yeah, that I think would be a good starting point for us. Okay. Um, and then an update on that tall building next to the bank building that they're talking about converting to 100 apartments. So, actually, yeah. they, there was a zone change for the smaller building, the 11 story building. That, that had started three years ago, and that uh, developer lost their funding, and so the project was dead, and then it got a new owner. So that one, they're actually doing some demolition now, so that's underway. And then the taller building right on the corner, uh, this journal had an article just the other day that another developer is either looking at buying that or has bought that, to turn it into housing. So the corner of Central and San Mateo could get very active in a couple of years. It'll be transformative if that happens. The New Mexico Bank building there? Yeah. yeah. And it's going to up the traffic counts. And the one area. next to it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Because they're the two buildings. The two buildings. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. But again, with increasing the number of people in the area, but not increasing the business to match to meet the demand of, the, of those people. There will be some yeah. um, on the ground floor of the yeah. smaller building, coffee shop, kind of, you know, there will be some kind of commercial. At least that's what we were told. And then my guess is in the bigger building, there'll be mixed use of the lower floor. Do you know if the zoning change on the smaller building does that apply to the bigger building too? Or is it just so, for that building? It's just for that guy. Oh, right. Um, so what I heard from you, Melinda, is a suggestion to go on now to the OPS plan to look at those points to see where you feel um what feedback we have on those. Um when so the the questions that I have for the non-compliance question for you is, you know, one thing we know about this year, I'll, I'm just going to just say real quickly, is we know this has been a kind of roller coaster year in terms of how the city is dealing with encampments, because this has been our year where we were dealing with the injunction and then the you know, injunction changed and then, you know, back and forth and round and round with that. And so um, are, are you aware that at this point, the way that the injunction stands is that the plaintiffs have backed off of the requirement to not move an encampment if um, we don't have security, but are pressing on on, on wanting storage for ID items. Um, and then we also have the Supreme Court right. case about to weigh in. So there's still, you know, some things that are, you know, going on that we're going to be watching and how we deal with those things. But uh, at, at this point, they're still giving 72 hours notice, requiring movement uh, of the camps. And so that's part of, you know, what has been uh, kind of a an interesting year for us in terms of looking at the encampments, looking at how to interrupt what's going on and um, satisfy the needs of the residents, but also trying to deal with those folks at the same time. So, um, you know, we can go into that more in depth, get the report out from Leon, who is one of the people that does the zone patrols, um, not patrols because he's not an officer, but like he, he's doing the zone and identifying the problem spots and reporting them to the accountant team a solid waste report back on how they are dealing with those situations, what their process policies are for, for dealing with the people. Um, and then we can go into some of these other parts, but I know that for all of you, um, well, oh, I'm not gonna say that. Uh, for how many people who are in the room are encampments like your number one concern about what's going on? And you, and your is the primary reason you're dissatisfied with the response. 
That's a quite a hard question. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. yeah, because it depends on where the incumbents are going and what's happening. But yeah, no, we're, we're we're gonna ask that a question. Okay, because anything is interlinked. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, the lack of business causes abandoned spaces, which provides opportunities yeah. Yeah, for really folks agree. to move in, and it affects you know police. Uh, patrolling and crime, but, you know, uh, but money, uh, yeah. if there's one thing I hear every day, you know, and, and they're asking me, what are you doing about a campus? To the best of my ability, I try to explain, and I try to hold the uh, city as accountable as possible, but you know, we're looking at generations of neglect here. The people have heard the excuses before. You really have. And, and I'm not in this. Things have gotten better. They've gotten better. But they're also remaining the same in the areas. You know, East of San Mateo, it's a different world. And but we all want that world to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want blue collar families to really have a shot at the American dream, mm -hmm. uh, which includes um, you know, better safety. Owning a home, and that's where Carrie comes in, uh, you know, helping folks with a down payment, you know, uh, all people that, that, whole, that whole piece. And, and uh, we really need, and, and you know, I know about Supreme Court as anybody else does. Uh, but again, uh, the reply back to me is yet another excuse you know, because some of these folks are just inundated. Uh, with, with, with uh, homeless situations and problems. San Pedro and Central oh. is another world. Oh, Lord. I mean, I can't, I wouldn't walk down that street. Oh. And I'm afraid it's just going to keep spreading and spreading and be like that absolutely everywhere. And it seems to be allowed to continue. So I have an answer. Yeah. Uh, and I always want to recommend. And, and point out the great job Commander Lincoln is doing. He's doing a real good job. And I was at a South San Pedro meeting, and uh, if I understood him correctly, uh, they're going to fence off that awful, awful uh, uh, roadway, uh, alleyway, and they're going to do the same thing for the alleyway back above us. But that's good. But where do all those people go? Right. And and my concern is mental illness. You know, I, I don't know that a lot of these people want to or are able to get a job and move into a house and, and be that citizen we'd like them to be. So behavioral health is huge. Yes, ma'am. So it's uh, our number one priority. Right. So that's that kind of overtakes the encampments in a way because that would solve a lot of the encampment problems. So I'm going to make note about the Ronald right County. At that same meeting, Nicole Rogers also mentioned that she has another $1.7 million that was just approved last week for more uh, pallet homes. I think that's what she had. Yeah, homes. In addition to the 50 that were, yeah. were purchased for another neighborhood. And then I know that there's been communication with Barboa about working with uh, 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 mental health services and, and addiction services. And, or coordination with that. We have a very active city councilor. Yeah. And on that alley in particular, we're after it's fenced up, one of the things we're talking about is uh, Bernalillo County Parks and Rec's open space are doing uh, a, an alleyway activation project kind of across the county. And so we're going to start working on uh, the 700 block in between Cardenas and Valencia right now. But after that alley's cleared out, uh, we want to, to see if we can partner with the county on that alley on San, San Pedro and Central particularly. But it, it has to be cleaned up first, so. And in terms of the people, um, I don't know how many of you are aware that ACS has had what they call pop-up resource fairs in that area. Um, and at each one, they have worked and done intake with, I, I wish I had bugged well, we weren't going to get into that this much today, but we will have 
um, the ACS come back. Uh, you remember Jody Jefferson? She was at that meeting as well. Yeah. They brought that up. Yeah. Great program. So they, 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 uh, it was a model they experimented with um, in that area. Um, and now they're taking it back regularly. And then they've also um, had it out in a number of the other areas of the city that are also hard hit. So the Illith and Coors area and, um, Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Check where is the other one? Pennsylvania Central. They, they've kind of gone back and forth, having a number of them in those spaces. They've had the street medicine team who have identified quite a few people who not only have mental illness, but with some very serious physical illness. Um, and they've been able to really get some people. And, and so a lot of that is building the trust and rapport to be able to start getting people to accept services as well. So we're working hard on taking the services to them where they are to try to figure out how to interrupt it before the areas close down and then stop so that you're getting some opportunity for the people to get connected and to actually accept that connection, which is a big part of the problem. So, yeah, that's a lot of what our site's going to be doing. We're going to have community health workers on site talking with folks as they come in. Uh, as if we perceive that from the ACS primarily. Um, I also wanted to mention and report unofficially, or maybe it's officially, that the Crisis Triage Center, have you guys heard about this? It's called the CTC, and it's out of UNM Hospital. Um, I understand they are uh, uh, opening at the end of the summer, or hoping to open at the end of the summer. And Maria, I wanted to see if you had any further uh, word about that. But that comes from Rodney. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, speaking of the series of mentally ill folks, um, of which our unhoused population uh, has an overrepresentation of because of the complex needs in our communities, um, this, this center will be able to serve them. So yeah, the Crisis Triage Center um, in part is based on a model that we've seen very successfully um, achieved in uh, uh, the Phoenix area and uh, in other states, obviously. But um, when you do that gap analysis of what have we not had that we're trying to fill the gap. So you see the five parts of Gateway that are coming on board to try to fill some of them. One of them, is going to be the crisis triage center and to really um terry's team may be sending people there yes um because as we talked about terry's team is going to be like the sorting hat of like okay who's a and, and acs will also take people directly there um but it will be linked to the the mental hospital at unm and so it um hopefully is going to create um a, a better uh intake process for the, the mental health hospital, which um, has been uh, a challenging situation right now. There's, I don't know exactly why, because I'm not there running it, but I'm we, trying to figure that out. We're, we're all trying, kind of like trying to figure out why. Um, but, but definitely when it comes to people in that crisis, um, they need to have a safe place to be. They need, um, sometimes they really do need to have um, that mental health intake. And so that crisis triage center is a major investment in our community, as is Terry's part, which will be the um, receiving area for first responders, ACS, APDA, adults, um, to then get them um, placed in, in, a, in the appropriate spot for them when, once they are stabilized. So yeah, that, that's a great thing that's coming on board as well. Is it true that the, it might, we might have it open in the summer? I think I've heard more fall. So, um, but but it is getting. It's we've never been closer. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new building. Yeah, I mean, it's a full new that. facility. It's not just like an added service in an existing space. It's a new facility over back behind um, the uh, uh, College of Medicine back over there. So um, it when it when we we can't wait till it comes on board, but um, you know it's it's one of those pieces that we have been needing so badly. 
So and I'm sure they'll have a this group and yeah. We'll have a presentation from them on that aspect. The same as we've had CARES campus come in and kind of talk about what services they're providing. John. Yeah, I have two little uh, technical questions. Um, one doesn't directly relate to this group. What what are those um, what are those like little generator units with the poles sticking up and they look like they have yeah. some sort of solar? Well, what is the function of those? It looks like they have something to do with the police department. Their camera systems. Oh, we do have cameras. Yeah, their camera systems. Yeah, camera. Did the you see flashing that? blue light is that the one? Yeah. yeah. They yeah. did turn break-ins in the cars. They're they're trailer cams. Okay. They're so, they're trailers that they can haul to places and have cameras that have 360 view and they're solar operated and, and they they can really help the turn crime. That's that's my good question. Yeah. The other one is uh, what are pallet phones? Yeah. Okay. Do you, I I just wanted to say not all camera trailers are APDs. Um, we have about 25 to 30 to deploy citywide, but those you see at big box stores. Those are leased or purchased by those stores. Yeah. Okay. And and then those store security run them and monitor them and use okay. them for investigation. What was your second question? Uh, yeah. uh, pallet homes. So pallet homes are, uh, anybody else want to fill in or do you want me to do it? You can go for it. Okay. So pallet homes are prefabricated homes that literally can be delivered on a pallet. They are, they're like, they pop out kind of they're they're yeah. corrugated plastic they're they're yeah, somewhat they're metal. Oh, and metal mm -hmm. and they have heating air conditioning they usually are set up with um a, kind of a room unit that, that has a, a bed and some small space and then they have congregate showers bathrooms and, and uh, dining or kitchen spaces associated with it so um, the way that they're set up is kind of in um, you know a little community setting. I would remind you of a campground like where you would have spaces where you have showers and bathrooms and stuff, and you can camp around the area. But it's the, their actual little homes. They're tiny homes. Okay, but they're different. And they're different from tiny home because they can also be easily kind of taken down and moved to another location as well. And they come ready to roll. They're just like, if they have them in their warehouse, they can shrink them over and set them up. And you're, I mean, it's it's very quick. Uh, there is the first tiny homes in, I mean, pallet, sorry, pallet homes in New Mexico's in Santa Fe. Um, I think at the first Lutheran church. And they just opened about two, three weeks ago. Um, and um, it, Pallet Homes is actually a trademark name. So they are a specific company that does it their way. But um, you, there are a number of other uh, types of that same thing where it's a pop-up street bed construction. So thank you. I was going to follow up on this. So are we going to go, like, is Albuquerque going to go with that group? So they're out of Seattle or whatever, right? They do the pallet homes. Did we... I think pallet homes was pretty successfully marketed to a lot of communities. And so I'm pretty sure pallet homes is actually the provider that we're looking at as well. At I went point. to this presentation when you gave it to, like, the Homeless Coordinating oh. Council, like, a year or two ago. So I just didn't know if we, yeah, if we were looking at going with them, too. Because I know in their model, like, they end up, employing a lot of in-house people to help like pop them up, like get them running, you know. Um, yeah, yes. we've already read the 50 purchase. Good. Okay. Yes. Yes. So Debbie O'Malley had, you know, was the person really pushing for this last fall, right. got the ball rolling. And I think the ball is rolling and it's snowballing and getting more, uh, with more, more housing as part of it. So it's an absolute recognition. So I just want to, I'm happy to take more questions, but it's 726 and we have to do the ops plan too. It, it is palletshelter.com is, I believe, is that company. And the main difference, John, is that there's no foundations involved. You know, prefab, and they can just set up on the project. They can teach it. 
the only uh, like it can be a parking lot, but you have to have a parking lot that has sewer for the bathrooms that are going to go as part of it. So it can't be just any lot. You do have to figure out your sewer hookups and like that sewer and water hookups. Okay. All right. Are we ready to tackle all the OPS plan issues or questions at this point? It must be yes. <laughs> I know, it was a resounding silence there. Everybody's working hard. Okay, Melinda. Okay. Um, so I'd like to talk about transportation and the shuttle system. I know a few months back when Jody from ACS was here, I mean, she did point out some of her clients and people she was working with that said that when they were turned away from here, they were just kind of set loose. On the street, which is a problem for the people being turned away, and a problem for the neighborhoods. Okay. Um, so, can I just tell you right now that based yeah. on Jody's thing, yeah. there was a, a, a very quick intervention with our operators, and that has been corrected with their discipline planning. Within, that's not happening anymore. Okay. Now, that being said, they do not have the right to hold people or force them into transportation. If somebody is, you know, insists on walking away, we cannot stop them unless they've done something illegal and probably eat, right? So, so the practice is not that people are just told leave the property. The, the practice is to transport them to their next space where they're going to be if they're not going to be there anymore. But so so right after that meeting, there was there was a meeting with the with the office. So just but I think it's a valid concern. I'm glad you said it, but I just want everybody to know that that actually could get dealt with that day. So okay, and the follow for that because I think a concern would be for whatever reason that they're not able to get in here. Uh -huh. And if they then are resisting getting put on the shelter of the transportation, you guys are part, like, what state are they in? And is that any kind of public safety risk for anyone they might be interfacing with, like, on their way out? So I don't know if you guys are pulling the data on that for the people that aren't admitted, don't stay, resist that, what that situation is. Um, so I think that would be helpful for... You mean like if people just walk up and they're trying to get in? Well, I mean, I don't know what the instances yeah. are, why they're not here, oh, or if they were brought in by or referred and then they get here and they decide, no, I don't. I and mean, I don't know all the different circumstances of why they wouldn't be admitted here and then be hopefully put on a shuttle or something safe to get them to where they need to go. Like, I don't know what those situations are. Well, that's a very good question. So, so based on community input, this facility is not a walk-up facility. Right. There are no day services, there are no walk-up services available. Um, and so the only way the this facility can be used is with referral. And I think it's pretty well known as a community. Because I can tell you, people at the WEC are often saying to me, hey, can you help me get into the gateway? So, um, so I think people know they have to have that referral and they know that there's a waiting list to get in. So, um, so with that in mind, if people do just show up and try to get in, there is a shuttle and Gateway does have a shuttle and it's the same provider as our other shelters. And so they can provide transportation to the other locations. We actually had an incident, not here, but at our, um, our family hotel, where a sheriff's officer didn't know what was what, figured it was just a shelter and dropped somebody off at our family hotel, but it was a man, um, just a single man. And so when we found out what went on, made sure to, um, that was before we had our, um, our uh, bed tracker that tells what the requirements are and where exactly the places are and how to call and get people in. So I think that, um, you know, the, the levels of communication have helped, but so I don't know if that helps. I mean, the, the, I don't, 
I wish Aries was here because she could tell you if there are incidents, but I think I would hear, I get incident reports for anything that goes on to shelters. And I honestly have not seen any incident reports. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think how long it's been for this location to have somebody show up who, who had not been admitted and had to be um, transported somewhere, yeah, somewhere else. So, and then, do you know the other thing was um, it says here that the city recognizes the current bus route closest to the Gibson Health Road Route 16 is not sufficient to meet the needs of Gateway Center guests and is committed to improving public transportation for guests. Um, and that at this time, of course, this was three years ago, Albuquerque Transit Department was exploring several options, including expanding the frequency of service on the Route 16 line or extending nearby bus lines with more frequent services, including 141, 41, 157. Do you know what the status of any of that is as far as kind of updating our bus lines to provide better service? I um, am not an expert on bus systems. I will say service expansion is probably not going to happen right now. Yeah. Uh, we have even more in than almost any other department. Bus drivers are one of our biggest challenges. So we've actually had to do service decreases on some of the other existing routes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, on that line, you know, we are working a lot on the hiring part of this. And, uh, you know, we've done events where we hire around 70 folks. Um, attrition is sort of an issue with these ones. So we're also in negotiations with the to try and find better contracts for them. <laughs> But I will say that um, it is written into the provider's contract that they provide con uh, transportation. Um, we provide a sundown and they drive up. So, right, Terry? You're pulling in here right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so that is, um, the, I mean, the transportation for the people who are here is provided, but the, the increased bus routes have not been able to for the reason. Does that answer that one? No, it does. I mean, I think yeah. these are just good things for us to kind of come back to again, because yeah. when we were looking at this building up and expanding into phases and how many people we can serve and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I just think there needs to be like infrastructure, personnel, resources, things in place as we look at building and increasing numbers of people we're trying to serve. So it's just one of those things that's like, oh, good to just come back and look like, where are we now? Like another year from now, like, where are we now? Um, we'll yeah. do it again, don't worry. Okay. okay. Who else has an ops plan concern or question that we can try to address? <laughs> Is the dining room uh, up and open? I'm sorry? The dining room is up open? The, di the the family housing, I mean, the Gateway Housing Navigation Center does have a small dining room for for the people there. That's for the women's shelter? Yeah. Yeah, we were seeing that it um, serves three meals a day. Is, is that what's happening? Yes. So not everybody leaves. Not everybody leaves. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a number of people who, you know, I think it's, you know, it tends to be about a 90 day cycle that, that they are going through. And again, I wish Arias was here because she could give you a better idea. But, you know, you have some people who, when they first get here, they're just sort of like, and they just want to sleep a lot and get caught up, kind of get ready, then, then start getting start working with their caseworker who's on site like everything's on site so so they don't have to leave for a lot of that initial intake figuring out um what resources the person has what we need to connect them to how things can work uh, what services they need whether they're medical mental health substance use um, housing, we need a driver's license, just like any of those things. And so um, there's not a requirement for them to leave. We've tried to make it a space where they can actually sit at a computer and, and accomplish what they need to do to get successfully housed at, at the end of their stay. And so um, the, it's the same for the West Side Shelter and the same for Family Shelter. Yeah, I don't know why I was under the impression that that wasn't working fully yet and that everybody left in the morning. 
Oh, you know why you thought that? I'll tell you why. Okay. <laughs> because we also had the winter shelter. Okay, so that's what I was just wondering yeah. if that was the difference. That's the difference. Winter shelters sort of traditionally are only open October through March. They're only night shelter. Some winter shelters, you're not guaranteed your same bed you had last night. Even if you come back night after night, you have to be there by a certain time. Um, like Brothers of the Good Shepherd, that's how they operate. Like the beds are cleared. It's a it's a new day every day with a new group, uh, depending on who gets there mm -hmm. in time and gets the first sets of beds. The, the winter shelter, the way it, it was operated was that if you came back the next night, you still had your bed. Um, and um, you, but you did have to pack up and leave for the day. Okay, but now you can come and stay for the night and then leave, or you can stay and, and get guidance and help. And so, winter shelter was um, it's already closed. It and it and it was only keeping people safe from the cold at night. That's what that's what a winter shelter is. <clears throat> The Gateway Housing Navigation Center is um, that 90-day model of stay, be safe, be fed, and let's, let's get figured out how best to get you exited into stable housing when you leave. So it's, it's a very different thing. Okay. And so when you have both of them going on, but you have the people getting actual help year yeah. round. Yeah. So in these numbers that you gave us, which ones um in do we know the different uh, winter shelter? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you want to get into this or not, but just curious. Out of the 49 Gateway Housing Center, 36 of those were just winter. Is that what that's saying? No. Um, okay. You, so the Gateway Housing Navigation Center has 50, up to 50 beds. And the emergency winter shelter um, was uh, usually 35. Yeah. And okay. So we have 36 there. So yeah. Oh, they added they added a bed after the 35 in case ACS had a need to bring a woman in to be safe for the night. We, we okay. needed to have that box. So those are separate numbers. Yeah. Okay. Those were separate numbers. Thank you. Okay. Other ops plan concerns or questions? Um, I'm just kind of going um, from the top down. Um, where it has APD currently works closely uh, with multiple city departments, the police always do the good stuff. Um, and then it talks about, um, so I was trying to look at something that was like working with businesses. And I just want to say, I know for a while there was a gentleman that was working like the, um, the San Pedro business corridor. I don't know if you can be on the sound of it. He's there anymore, Jose. Oh, Jose yeah. retired. Yeah, so he's not there, but I didn't know, is there anyone or any kind of group like that within the community that's working, say with businesses along Gibson? Or San Mateo, or is that something we could pursue with the We did pursue it, and okay. unfortunately, we didn't have a huge response. Okay. Um, we had Mr. Sacco came, um, Subway right. came, Portland Federal Credit Union came. Okay. Um, but a lot of the businesses, and it happens with all of our business alliances, because unfortunately, they just can't give up someone during the day to attend a meeting. Um, and so we typically will get a large response, a larger response at the beginning, and then it can make a response. We did try, um, but unfortunately, I never took off. Okay. Do you know what half of what came of the one with San Pedro that Jose Brianos was working with? Um, that one is no longer functioning either, but the revitalized that Pedro group is. Okay. And so um, that one is working pretty well. Okay. Um, and it's it's uh, four neighborhoods working together. Okay. With the businesses. Okay. Because I just I was really excited by what he was trying to do. I mean, I just admired the he was trying to do it. Um, and I didn't know what they're doing now. So I know you was driving there. Like it looks like they put some work in the murals or just some things like beautifications along that mm -hmm. corridor. And it's kind of a nice way to model. I don't know for some of the other corridors as well, but. 
Um, and they also did get a Main Street designation there, so um, that helps a lot. Yeah. And I know Alex is working on that too, for some of them, obviously. But okay. Okay, other questions? Anybody else? Any other ops plan concerns, questions, verifications? Linda. Yeah, again, it just goes to the solid news picking stuff up daily. And the Department of Family and Community Services public outreach team is responsible for addressing encampments on all public property like those parks and stuff. So I just think we've got to have some stronger language in the GNA that addresses this, and we've got to up the personnel somehow. And then the phone number, that's like those are the big things I had. And then in the final thing, the community impact, um, the city will explore options for supporting businesses in the vicinity of the Gateway Center, including strategies identified in the Homeless Coordinating Council's community coordinated framework on homelessness. And I don't know if anyone's like looked through that document, but that document was drafted, I think even pre-COVID or the beginning of it. And um, I know the, the committee that drafted that framework document disbanded and is no more. Um, and I know there was a lot of frustration on the part of providers as well as neighborhood representatives that a lot of work went into that document and that things weren't being upheld. And when we had a meeting to kind of evaluate where things stood and how we were doing, criticism wasn't taken well, and that's when the city decided to just disband it versus addressing what was brought up. But I think that might be a valuable document that um, I have it, like I could get it to you, Maria, if you want to disseminate it to everybody and maybe down the road, we look at going into that because I think there's some really good, you know, ideals and intentions laid out in that too, that it might be constructive for everyone here that's really engaged to look at. Great, great idea. Um, if you send it, I'm happy to share. Okay. Yeah. Other concerns on the OPS plan? Under security and safety in the community, there's a statement that the purpose of the public safety will be to better coordinate existing resources and efforts. Community public policing will be included. Meaning what? Community policing. What does that mean? There's so many definitions of it. <laughs> when I was working at the ECHO program, I was like, what is our definition here going to be? So um, you know, we can come back to you to tell you what that looks like. Of course, in that time since that was drafted, we've had a lot of changes. Uh, so I think it would probably be worth a review on it again. What do you think about Yeah. Um, but overall, in general, it means working with all the stakeholders. Um, in partnership, so recognizing that, you know, the community has to be involved and bring resources and APD has to be involved and bring resources um, and can't just be one or the other. So it's really that partnership and bringing all stakeholders to the table. So this is an example of community. So stakeholder includes neighborhoods and people. Neighborhoods, businesses. Everybody, anyone that can impact a problem. Or a it's a creation of block captive program, and that's another exciting example. Mm -hmm. We need to be seen. And what what program? Neighborhood Watch. Oh, oh yeah, the Neighborhood Watch and the training that you can do for them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Does anybody have any other big burning issues that we want to address? It's a quarter to now. So I want to 
I don't want to rush you, but I just want to see, are you feeling like we still have a lot of things within it that you want to go through or that you already highlighted that you're concerned about? I have a question here. Um, and I'm maybe backing up, but I'm actually going forward through the document. Um, solid waste will clean and remove trash daily from areas surrounding the Gateway Center. Defined area. Please. Where's that one? So page 10, the role of solid waste department in the middle of the page. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying okay because I can't answer that <laughs> just, I'll have to go back to them to determine how that's being handled exactly and we do have solid waste on our list of people who are going to come and talk to the group about how they're working with and coming citywide and then in this area as well and uh, what kind of numbers they're looking at how they are tracking where um, they're doing more work. So, next question: Role of the Department of Municipal Development, investment in public safety infrastructure in the areas close to Gibson Health Hub will be prioritized. Could you define that, please? <laughs> So I'm wondering if like one of the ways that that has been prioritized is that ACS is based here and the new ACS building is going here and then the funding going into the um, Southeast Area Association, things like that. Do you, do you think that's what they're That's the sort about of here? thing, yeah. Okay. This, okay. This okay. Public safety infrastructure, this whatever also, that is. Yeah, this can also include stuff like new street lighting. Um, this can include, it can include a variety of different things. Uh, but basically, it's anything part of the built environment designed to keep people safe. And I think that's important to explore too, because that ACS building and the substation were already in the works before like yes. this yes. even got drafted. So I think it's if you get to look at yeah, what are the continuing efforts to that degree? Okay. Do we know what? The plan is for the rest of the property um, north of the ACS. Um, so right now, I think one is a retaining pond area. Uh, the rest is still going to be in this, like in planning before even design. So the short answer is there's nothing that's going to be going in post building of the ACS headquarters. Um, the city's still exploring the funding options to make sure that we can continue that project, but we don't have anything like that at this moment. Yeah. Hey, Korea. Hey, uh, Councilor Rogers is looking at bringing a Silver Street type market to the property. She's looking for funding right now. And it's a very interesting project because uh, you know, they could actually be a garden on the roof of the building. You know, it, it's very innovative. And, and uh, the ACS building. It is transformed, will be transformative to that community, but two thirds of the property, it, you know, I, I mean, to, to have no plan makes my head explode. Those are no fun. So it's oh, uh, okay. Let me answer that. Uh, one time, a long time ago, we were going to put a police station. Yes, I'm still waiting. And Pat Dave spent money, and the money was there. And then Black Lives Matters happened. Remember that episode? And the city back that we put building a new police station. I don't, I, I again, I don't think we should have. Right? So the city was going to renovate the existing facility. The money was taken from Public Service Hill and to uh, uh, renovation. Yeah. Uh, with the promise, it would be restored. Now, will I see that in my lifetime? You know, I, it, it needs to be restored right away. And we need to completely develop that property. And I'm going to lobby again. We need a green belt there. We need a place for people to go, for kids to, for kids to, to use. 
And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and then the other piece of it was affordable housing. So, they, so they get, the property is designated mixed use. So our market could go there. Uh, affordable housing units could go there. Uh, but it's so army and, and uh, just, there's no way here and Doug, the one that I'm talking about this, the funding just isn't there. So what we've done is figure out a way to get that funding restored. Yeah, I'm actually going to use this as an opportune moment to say that everyone, if you are available on May 8th, you should join us for what we're calling constructive conversations. Already uh, signed up. Already yeah. signed up? Great. Yeah, good to you signed up? Good. For those that haven't signed up, uh, we're talking a lot right here about things around the gateway that we want built, what we want to see in the community around it. This will be a meeting led by Mayor Keller and with Councillor Rogers, in which we'll be discussing the built environment in Albuquerque. So if you are wanting to talk about uh, more like a green space, right? If you're wanting to talk about street lighting, if you're wanting to talk about new intersections or roads, that will be a perfect opportunity to do that because we are trying to gather community input for this. We are trying to coalesce more of a vision around what each council district should look like, what people want in it and where they want it. Uh, so we can, I'll share that with Maria and she'll be able to share that with the group, but uh, that is a perfect time to help share that information because I think that is a, a space where we'll actually be together specifically for them. Um, on that note, you guys have access to all the notes that were taken at the community meeting at Whittier Elementary that your architects that now I think did the ECS building have because we had a big meeting where we did discuss all these things. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and we also had one that Mariela Ruiz led. Um, Alex spoke at that one as well. That was probably a year or two years ago. It was Cesar recorded. Chavez. There was, yeah, yeah, Cesar Chavez. And so, and I believe that was recorded, but I think it'd be valuable for all the people maybe that can't be there made. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have been showing up to these meetings in the years prior, and notes were taken. Mm -hmm. So if there's a way to access that, that would just be valuable to kind of see the history of input the city has had. Definitely. I mean, those were more site-specific, obviously, but um, still, I think it speaks to the greater things that the... Absolutely. So actually, on that note, the way that these meetings are going to be structured is the first, like, 30 to 40 minutes will be sort of presentations on whether we're referring to as like citywide projects, right? So Gateway obviously qualifies as a citywide project. ACS headquarters qualifies as a citywide project. Other ones are gonna be the rail trail uh, in the downtown area, the CNM rail yards, um, and some of the upgrades to the Balloon Fiesta Park, the Bio Park, and so on and so forth. Um, so, but we don't wanna spend the whole time just talking about things that are currently being built. The other portion will be a interactive session where we're asking folks to sort of walk the room. Uh, we'll have boards set up so that if you want to and give folks like a slate of stickers um, to sort of put their vote up for what they would like to see most. So if you want more street lighting, you can put it up on the street lighting. If you would like more green space, put it up there. So that's sort of the idea behind those, but ACS, just letting you know that specific site is on one of the citywide project lists, and um, we are pulling as much information and notes and history on the public input on those ones as we can prior to presenting. We did that same thing. Yes. We promise yeah. 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 it was yeah. not lost. Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. So if we have to just like yeah. dig it up, that would be great. Yeah. Um, thank you. What day of the week? What time? That's a, when, I think it's a Wednesday. It's May 6 to 8. 6 to 8. And you know why we've gone through this before and been disappointed? The one thing we have going for us, we have an active city housework. Yeah. And I, well, I'm putting a lot of my money on her. To make sure that what we shake hands on gets done. Okay, Melinda. I just have one more thing. Um, I forgot to look at the very back of the office plan. This has been like the thorn in my side since it started. Um, exhibit A, the map of this community action area. They have the radius starting at the center of this property versus the perimeter of this property. As we know, it's a giant property. It eats up a big part of that quarter mile. So any radius should be starting from the perimeter of this property, not from the center of it. And the community action area at a minimum needs to encompass those neighborhoods that are part of the agreement. And my neighborhood, Parkland Hills, is not fully incorporated into this radius for one. I know that much. 
And for anyone else who's here representing their neighborhood, they can look and see if their neighborhood is incorporated in this C community action area, but ours fully is not. I see on page three, there's been a change from quarter mile to half mile by um, one yeah, yeah, that that was announced October, November. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I'd be nice if there was some map. I don't know how you do a radius on a perimeter, you know, that'd be like two well, feet kind of a mile. Yeah, so, the way that the mapping is done, John, is that you, you basically take the perimeter of the property and expand that out the quarter. <laughs> so you end up with a kind of weird bubbly shape. It's not a circle. It's the shape. That's the way all the notifications are done for city projects. So this notification, and this should be no different. It should not be a circle. It should be a distance out from each property. That the, one of the reasons that this year's amendment process is trying to change the adjacency and the distance has to do with GIS mapping. So you know they, they can plug in on GIS to provide uh, you know, 100 feet out or a quarter mile out of the property. But I'm guessing property. that what happened is you had, you know, one of our contract analysts get a map and draw a circle instead of working with our planning department to do a permit, which would have been a different yeah. part of these things. So I, I'm guessing that's why yeah. you have this different. Yeah, we all are aware of the, uh, that this gateway building or certain our buildings is uh, encircled by enormous parking lots. So are we saying that it should be a half mile out you know, the from the edge of the, the edge of the property line? So property the property not, not the building. Well, that's the gonna be a, that's gonna be a drastically different area than well well because as it is not like when it was at the quarter mile because of where it was located, the quarter mile basically got you to the shopping center across the street because so much of that was parking lot and building and then Gibson and then so it didn't even get you really beyond like the north and eastern, you know, like going far. So that's just been again. I mean, I think all these things that have been brought up, a lot of it comes back to like what we were promised with this like public safety corridor. We were gonna fight cops, we were gonna have like all these things. And um, and I think this was the concern from the outset, and again. I just want to communicate. I believe in all the ideals that are laid out here. I clearly do because I'm here every month, unless I've been like sick or out of town. But I think we all knew that when the city was making these promises, they were biting off one thing too. I think we all knew, like, we know we're understaffed in all these departments. We know we don't have like the funding. We know when a budget, an operational budget of $4 million a year was presented to run this place. That was ludicrous. Like anyone that knows, like, so we're hearing all these things, and it's like we all can see like what's coming. And it doesn't mean like we don't believe in what you're trying to do, but what you're outlining for us, like, simply is not realistic. So, can we all be real here? And I think I'm glad everyone's still coming to these meetings. We're all sitting at the table to talk through this because I think it's like engaged people from like city and providers and neighborhoods coming together that will help this and move it forward. But I think what we would appreciate is like just hearing. So I've been in a lot of meetings where it's good to pat yourself on the back when you're doing good, but it would also be really nice for someone to say like, yeah, we haven't delivered and we need to do better. And just like to recognize that because I think the city needs to do better by a lot of the people sitting in this show. And that's just, mm -hmm. that's it. It's like the nicest way I can say it. So. And we really hear you, and you really have brought your time to this table. And, and I think we've had some really good conversations lately where we're really talking about things and trying to be really straight about things. So if they said four million, <laughs> I have well, reported many times. Yeah. But that was before COVID. Everything was better, but not like COVID. So, <laughs> so, you know, obviously, 
again, you know, none of us were <laughs> part of any of those calculations. And so really, we, we do want to be really straight about the reality and, and where we are and what we're really trying to do and what has been really hard and what, um, you know, we, we agree we want to do better. And I, and I think we agree we can all do better together working on these things. So <laughs> we need to move the needle. And it's stuck. We just got to move it. No, so it if you told us a bone, could you ask the mayor to approve tomorrow that the half mile public safety district will be at the perimeter? We'll do the perimeter. I mean, that seems so reasonable. Yeah. And we've asked, and, and, and the thing that's, that grabs me is uh, a lot of times we get no response. And, and as I've said to some people candidly, even a go to hell <laughs> would be something. Okay, I don't even get that. And, and, and others feel the same way. But boy, that would be huge if we could get something tomorrow that the, the half mile, which has never been a circle realistically, hasn't, uh, will be at the perimeter of the property. Boy, that that'd be good news for the community. Yeah, so we'll we'll go ahead and update the print of this because I think that's pretty simple. Yeah, and, and it won't be tomorrow, but we will well, give you an updated map. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's done by people who really know what they're doing. I'm sure, you don't want it <laughs> here now. It will not be me. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I hear you on that. I think that's you're not the entire All right, so the. For, so it's 803, so we're ending a little bit late already. So, but I want to clarify what we want in the next meeting. So um what we were going to do, but this meeting was try to work with APD on setting some baseline measures so that um, it's not just perception, but actually looking at actual trackable incidents to determine, you know, impact in this area over time. And so, Laura, would, um, last meeting we had Carrie Prothero, 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 Prothero um, from 311 talking about things that she can report on each month. And she, she said that next month she'll be ready with the things that you ask for. And so setting up, so... Part of what we're looking at is getting, you know, a baseline measure and then comparisons over time that we can really look at 311 calls with specific types of incidents, APD calls with specific types of incidents, and then be able to look at it over time. So do you want or do you want to talk to Laura and uh, Lieutenant Stevenson? I always want to say Simon. Stevenson. Um, about some of the stats that they can track and that we can get some baseline numbers and then start having monthly reporting on where we stand on some of those things. Okay. So so that will be so so that will be next month, which is the May meeting. What did you decide on May 30 or May 23? Uh, oh, so it's not like a Memorial Day or something. Oh, for that week. May the twenty third is Thursday before Memorial Day. Sorry, I'm looking at April. So yeah, I mean the twenty third or the thirtieth. Uh, I think we were going with the thirtieth. On everything we had, did we have a reason we weren't getting off to? Oh, I know. <laughs> There's a reason. I'm gonna be out of town on the third again. So, but but when so so but it's not all about me. I mean, we can have Sony Ash facilitate the sessions, but I but I need you guys to know that I I have to be out of town on the thirtieth for a wedding, and then um in June I'm gonna be gone for a lot of the month of June. So um so that's part of what I wanted to talk to you guys about is do you want to do the twenty third instead, and then I can join you and we can be a consistent work through or do you want to stick with the 30th i thought the meeting was going to be fourth thursday of the month yeah the last thursday. well like the 23rd and then we can come here 
I'll take the phone. Oh, thank you guys. I'll meet you. So then the question is um, on June uh, 27th, I will definitely not be here as well. So do you, do you want to have somebody, do you, I, I would, what I'd like to do is have in advance what we want to cover that night. And uh, maybe that can be when Solid Waste comes in to talk about the interaction team. Um, do you want to do that? Or, or would you rather get an update from um, Terry Bruner and Alex on some of the economic development stuff instead? Like, what's the name on it? Maybe, I don't know. I'm just. Maybe we should right. try to do everybody at the same, on the same meeting. We should spread them out. So I was, um, I was saying May what? is uh, APD right. and then June is um, either solid waste or the economic development perspective. What, yeah. What's your preference? Economics. Economics, economics, economics is probably more important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. For the May meeting, because um, we're going to be looking at like data relating to APD, we might want to pull back up like the UNM study that was and was not because that I know a lot of the focus groups um, and when they were doing the roundtables and going over what those studies came up with, the studies really fell short. And I think us reviewing, I don't know, because it was also brought up at the time, like the type of data we could be trying to pull moving forward that would be helpful in terms of evaluating like impacts, best practice, et cetera. I just think it'd be worth going back and looking at that when we're looking and trying to pull a lot of data and we should be looking at that study and like what other kind of studies could be done as we move forward as well. I think that study is still on our website. I think or so. I mean, I have it on my computer if you don't have it. Meeting. So um, we, can, we can send it out in advance for, for advanced reading. Okay, sure. Um, and and will you invite Lieutenant Stevenson to come through? Um, and then um, you know ACS, we can also look at at their stats as well if you want as part of that. But but that some of those they they've gone from one to another, but we can try to pull those from they're they're kind of combination based. That can be another conversation. Sorry. Okay, so so are we in agreement? The next meeting is sort of crime stats and baseline measure determination, and then the next we'll we'll work on economic development and the metropolitan redevelopment efforts. Okay, is that well, ACS is that you're including that on May twenty third? We'll, we'll that's, see. That's not exactly crime. Yeah, let, let's. I'll, I'm going to put a big question mark there, and then we'll see what's the best way to deal with that as a baseline measure. Because they're already part of the 311 that Carrie Prothero has. Um, and so it would just be the other more crisis oriented ones that are the 911 call for immediate call. So, and the 242 cops come through there too. So, so they can get. Measured the same way as our APD calls, right? Out of the same of the numbers before they were yeah. on fire. Yeah, so we'll we'll look at how that works in terms of past information too. So okay. thank you all. Thank you all for just a really good conversation and just really being thoughtful about what we need to explore more. And um you know, we'll try to get some answers and updates on some of these things if there's any other information that we share and explore with these and others if we're going to have to try to update that dog you know, for, for what the next hour is. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.